morning again. In this presentation and then on the third presentation I will do this morning, <clears throat> we'll talk about some of the technical aspects of mechanical ventilation. So in this presentation, we'll talk about some of the technical aspects related to the ventilator circuit for invasive ventilation. And then on my next talk, we will talk about non-invasive ventilation. I think that these are important things for all of us to appreciate at the bedside, because many times, as you know, the devil's in the details, and the details may have to do with how we manage the ventilator circuit. These, again, are my disclosures. I do not believe that these have any impact on what I'll talk about this morning. Illustrated on this slide is a typical ventilator circuit for invasive mechanical ventilation. So here is the circuit leading from the ventilator to the patient and then back from the patient to atmosphere. There is typically a humidifier that is placed in line to warm and humidify the gas because the gas delivered from the ventilator is a very dry and often cold gas. There are various ways that we can humidify the gas, either with passive or with active humidifiers. We'll talk more about that in a minute. There is a certain amount of gas that is compressed in the ventilator circuit. And due to gas compression, some of the gas that is delivered from the ventilator does not make it to the patient. So the ventilator may put out a tidal volume of 500 milliliters, but there might only be 400 milliliters that goes to the patient because of gas compressed in the circuit. The good news is that I believe all modern ventilators on the market compensate for the gas compression. So in other words, when we dial in a tidal volume on the ventilator, of 400 milliliters, the ventilator corrects for gas compression so that that volume is actually delivered to the patient. <clears throat> we can deliver aerosolized gases or we can deliver aerosolized drugs or gases by injecting them into the ventilator circuit. I'll talk more, more detail about that in a few minutes. It's important to appreciate the amount of bed space, which is the volume of the circuit between the Y connector and the patient. The volume of the dead space in the circuit will effectively reduce the alveolar ventilation or alveolar volume for the patient. So we want this dead space to be as small as possible. We want to avoid placing tubing between the Y connector and the patient. And we want to avoid, to the extent possible, adding other devices to the circuitry, which could increase the dead space in the circuit and reduce the effective ventilation. <clears throat> we can assert, insert monitoring devices like capnometers, pressure and flow sensors into the circuit. And then most modern ventilators also place a bias flow through the circuit during exhalation and that improves triggering. So now let's talk for just a few minutes about humidification, the importance of warming and humidifying the inspired gas. One way that this can be done is with an active heated humidifier where there is essentially a water bottle. Gas is passed over that warm water in order to increase the temperature and the humidity of the gas. It is important that the humidifier is set correctly to deliver an appropriate amount of humidity to the patient. <clears throat> so for example, we want to, typically we will want to deliver gas at 37 degrees centigrade. 
100% relative humidity, and then to heat the circuit, typically with heated wires in the circuit, to maintain that heat and humidity for delivery to the patient. As you can see on the bottom panel, if the temperature is set too low, then that can decrease the amount of humidity delivered to the patient, and that can result in drying of secretions, that can result in occlusion of the endotracheal tube, and so forth. One of the simple things that we can do at the bedside is to observe for condensation in the circuit near to the patient. If we see that there is some condensation in the circuit, that indicates that there is fully humidified gas delivered to the patient. On the other hand, if we see that the circuit is completely dry, that suggests that the level of humidity delivery may be too low, and that increases the risk for airway occlusion due to dried secretions. <clears throat> Another way that we can warm and humidify the inspired gas is by using a passive humidifier, sometimes called a heat and moisture exchanger or an artificial nose. The way that these devices work is that there is a hygroscopic or hydro hygrophobic material so that when the patient exhales through this material, much of the heat and humidity from the patient is trapped in the device and then is delivered back to the patient on the subsequent inhalation. So this device then is placed between the ventilator circuit, so the ventilator circuit would be here, and the patient, the patient would be here, the patient exhales through the device, traps heat and humidity, Heat and humidity then gets delivered back to the patient. Now these devices are very simple to use. However, there are some potential issues with heat and moisture exchangers. For example, these devices add dead space into the ventilator circuit. And for some of these devices, the dead space can be quite large, as I will show you in a minute. So these devices ideally should not be used if we are delivering small tidal volumes. So if we're delivering a tidal volume to the patient of 100, uh, 400 milliliters, but the volume of the heat and moisture exchanger is 100 milliliters, that effectively reduces the ventilation for the patient. If the patient has copious secretions, it is generally best to avoid the use of a heat and moisture exchanger because the heat and moisture exchanger is not as efficiency, as efficient as a heated humidifier. And also the heat and moisture exchanger may become occluded with secretions if the patient coughs secretions into the device. With high minute ventilations, the heat and moisture exchanger is less efficient. It is less efficient with hypothermia, so it relies on trapping exhaled heat from the patient and delivering that back on the subsequent inhalation, so that will not be effective if the patient is cool. And then these devices are, are not effective if the exhaled tidal volume is less than the inhaled tidal volume, such as if there's a leak so if the patient has a bronchopleural fistula with a chest tube and there's a large leak through the chest tube, there will be less exhaled breath through the device, which will reduce the efficiency of the device. Now, all of that said, there was this meta-analysis published within the last two years, about a year and a half ago, that concluded that there was no superiority for either heat and moisture exchangers or heated humidifiers in terms of artificial airway occlusion, pneumonia, and mortality. And these authors suggested that the choice of humidifier should be made according to the clinical context, avoiding complications, 
and reaching the appropriate performance at lower cost. Heat and moisture exchangers tend to be less costly than heated humidifiers, which is part of the attraction of those devices. But I believe that we do need to keep in mind that they add dead space into the circuit and also add a bit of resistance into the circuit. It's also important to appreciate that not all heat and moisture exchangers are equivalent. There are big differences from one manufacturer to another. This is a very rigorous study published about 10 years ago that compared the humidification performance of 48, four dozen heat and moisture exchangers, passive airway humidifiers. And what they found was that in terms of absolute humidity, and I apologize, this doesn't project very well, but in terms of absolute humidity, some of the devices performed very well, some of the devices performed very poorly. So you need to know if you use heat and moisture exchangers in your unit, whether the ones that you use are highly performing devices or poorly performing devices. And you can pull this paper from CHESS 10 years ago to help to answer that question. They also found, this is dead space volume, they found a big difference among devices in dead space volume. Some devices had a dead space volume as low as about 30 milliliters, whereas other devices have a dead space volume as high as 100 milliliters. So my point is then that not all of these devices, not all of the dozens of devices that are commercially available are equivalent. And you need to know if you use these devices in your practice, whether the one that you are using is a good one or a poor performing device. And certainly this is the thing that we want to avoid in our mechanically ventilated patients. This is a patient, this is the endotracheal tube from a patient who needed to be, uh, have to be reintubated because of occlusion of the endotracheal tube. This is a patient with a tracheostomy tube where we needed to change out the tracheostomy tube because of occlusion within the tube. So if you are seeing this kind of a problem in your ICU, that is suggesting that your means of humidifying the inspired gas may not be as good as it should be. And if you are using a heat and moisture exchanger, for example, you might consider using one that is more efficient or using a heated humidifier instead of a heat and moisture exchanger. So this is something which can, uh, can be a big problem in the ICU if you don't pay attention to the details of how the gas is humidified. A few things about uh, troubleshooting. So it's important that we pay attention to the technical aspects of the ventilator circuit in regards to troubleshooting. So we want to avoid issues such as disconnection of, of the ventilator circuit from the airway. We want to monitor for leaks in the system. So for example, if the exhaled tidal volume is much lower than the inhaled tidal volume, that means that there's a leak and the leak might be among the connections in the circuit. If you're using a heated humidifier, the leak may be around the heated humidifier and its connections. The cuff may not be fully inflated on the endotracheal tube and so forth. So we need to monitor both the inhaled and the exhaled tidal volume because any difference between those will be the result of leaks that need to be corrected so that it does not impact on the ventilation of our patient. If we are using a heated humidifier, we need to monitor the circuit for excessive condensate and we need to clear that condensate from the circuit on a regular basis. If we are using a passive humidifier, we need to evaluate that for clogging with secretions. In patients who have a lot of secretions, the passive humidifier 
can become occluded with secretions and that can impact the ventilation of our patient. It's also important that we set alarms appropriately on the ventilator as a balance between patient safety and staff nuisance. Alarm fatigue, I think, is a very real thing in the ICU where there tends to be a lot of false alarms and the ventilator can be a contributor to alarm fatigue. So clinically, at the bedside, we should be setting the alarms on the ventilator so that we can avoid issues such as, or we can recognize, not avoid, but recognize issues such as disconnect and leaks and so forth. Uh, but we also need to set the alarm so that there are not a lot of false alarms. Now I want to talk a little bit about aerosol delivery during mechanical ventilation. It's is something that is very commonly done in the ICU, particularly for patients with obstructive lung disease. So let's take a few minutes to talk about how we can deliver aerosols during, the, uh, during mechanical ventilation. There are a number of things that affect aerosol delivery from a nebulizer during mechanical ventilation. For example, if the inspiratory time is lengthened, that will increase the amount of aerosol that is delivered to the patient. If we breath actuate the nebulizer, in other words, if the ventilator actuates the nebulizer during the inspiratory phase only, that will increase the amount of aerosol delivery to the patient. If we are using a heat and moisture exchanger, generally we need to remove that or bypass it during aerosol therapy because most heat and moisture exchangers are very effective filters and they will filter the aerosol before it is delivered to the patient. The nebulizer position in the circuit is important. So if we place the nebulizer closer to the ventilator, that will deliver more aerosol than if we put the nebulizer closer to the patient. If we bypass the humidifier, that will increase the aerosol delivery. But I suggest from a practical standpoint that you do not do that because bypassing the humidifier, although it increases aerosol delivery, it will dry the inspired gas, which may have may result in other complications for the patient. And then, as I had pointed out earlier, most modern ventilators have a bias flow, and that has the effect of washing aerosol from the ventilator circuit. Some ventilators allow us to adjust the bias flow. Many ventilators do not. I think it is important to appreciate that that can affect the amount of aerosol delivery to the patient. And then if we use a lower density gas like Heliox, that will increase the aerosol delivery. However, that's not very practical and I don't know that many do that in their practice. If we use a heat and moisture exchanger, as I pointed out, these devices tend to be very effective filters of aerosol. So we either need to remove that during the aerosol therapy, or there are several of these devices that are commercially available that allow an adjustment of the device so that the HME will be bypassed during aerosol therapy. So in this device, for example, there is one setting, which is a typical setting where the uh, heat and moisture exchanger is engaged. There is another setting for aerosol therapy where the material in the device is bypassed so that the aerosol can be delivered to the patient. And then there's at least one device such as this one that is commercially available that will allow the aerosol to actually pass through the device so it can stay in line during mechanical ventilation. But as a general rule, the heat and moisture exchanger, if you use it, should be bypassed or removed during aerosol therapy. 
As I pointed out previously, there is more aerosol that is delivered if the nebulizer is placed between the ventilator and the humidifier. So in this uh, picture, here is the humidifier, here is the ventilator outlet, the gas is delivered from the ventilator through the nebulizer, then through the humidifier, and on to the patient. And there are now a number of studies in the literature that show the placement of the nebulizer at this position before the humidifier results in more aerosol delivery uh, to the patient. In this example, a mesh nebulizer is, is being used rather than a jet nebulizer. At least in the United States, mesh nebulizers have become very popular as an alternative to a jet nebulizer during mechanical ventilation. <clears throat> Here's a study published a few uh, years ago. This was uh, uh, a comparison of nebulizer type and type of nebulizer during mechanical ventilation. This was done on a pediatric bench model, although I think the results also apply to adult mechanical ventilation. And they looked at the position of the nebulizer at the outlet of the ventilator, as well as the position of the nebulizer closer to the patient. And they compared two types of nebulizers, jet nebulizer and a mesh nebulizer. And what they found was that there was not a lot of difference in aerosol delivery between the jet and the vibrating mesh nebulizer. However, you can appreciate that there is a significantly greater increase in aerosol delivery when the nebulizer is placed at the outlet of the ventilator rather than closer to the patient. So then to maximize aerosol delivery during mechanical ventilation, a very simple thing that we can do is to place the nebulizer before the humidifier rather than close to the patient. Now what about pressurized meter dose inhalers? We can also use pressurized meter dose inhalers during mechanical ventilation. In this study, now more than 20 years old, uh, it was shown that in patients with COPD, there was a significant reduction in airways resistance with four puffs of albuterol delivered into the ventilator circuit. And in fact, they found that if they added eight more puffs or 16 more puffs, there was no further reduction in airways resistance. So these data would suggest that in patients with obstructive lung disease, we can have a significant reduction in airways resistance with a pressurized meter dose inhaler delivering albuterol with as four, as four, as few as four actuations into the ventilator circuit. Now it is important here again that we pay close attention to technique. So there are a number of ways shown on this slide that the pressurized meter dose inhaler can be inserted into the ventilator circuit. And now there are a number of studies beginning with this one, quite old, and a number of subsequent studies showing that we should use a spacer device in the ventilator circuit if we use a pressurized meter dose inhaler. And we should not use other devices that do not incorporate a spacer because the spacer significantly improves the amount of aerosol delivery to the patient. A practical question then might be, so which one should we use? Should we use a nebulizer, a jet nebulizer, a mesh nebulizer? Should we use a meter dose inhaler? Does it matter? which one we use. Is one better than the other? These are some clinical practice guidelines published now more than 10 years ago, which I think are still relevant, where the authors of this guideline suggest that either, both, or either nebulizers or pressured, pressurized meter dose inhalers can be used effectively to deliver beta agonists to mechanically ventilated patients. So you can use either the nebulizer or you can use a pressurized meter dose inhaler. However, regardless of the device that you use, you need to have careful attention 
to the details of the technique for either a pressurized meter dose inhaler or a nebulizer. And this is really what is most critical. So the technical aspects of the delivery, where we put the nebulizer, the type of device that we use to actuate the meter dose inhaler, some of those details are much more important than whether we choose one device or the other. So in summary then, I think that the details of the ventilator circuit are an important consideration during mechanical ventilation. It's important to consider how we will humidify the inspired gas. It is important to consider whether the inspired gas is being adequately warmed and humidified. It's important to consider how much dead space there is in the ventilator circuit. Minimize the amount of circuitry between the Y connection and the circuit and the artificial airway. Because if there's excessive dead space in the circuit, that reduces the effective alveolar ventilation for the patient. Humidification can be provided by either active or passive devices. But if we use an active device, we need to have it set so that it fully warms and humidifies the inspired gas. If we use a passive device, we need to appreciate that there are lots of different ones that are on the market. And some are more effective than others. So try to use one in your practice that is the most efficient, the greatest humidity delivery, and the lowest amount of dead space. And then finally, aerosols can be delivered either with a nebulizer or with an inhaler. They can be effectively delivered either way. The device that you choose will be based upon cost primarily, I think, and your biases as a clinician. But with either device, it is important, again, to pay attention to the details of the technique. So with that, I will stop, turn the podium back to Juan. This is, I, I have to tell you, I'm setting a record today. I'm usually the guy who goes over. So I'm finishing on time for a change. Thank you very much.